Good morning, everyone. Today we are going to go over line 7 of the Bagua Linear 64. We're also going to do some work with Shuaijia knee opening, back opening, um, our Chung shoulder circles. We're also going to fit in 100 Chuan in there. Anything else fun and exciting? Hip roll, wall set, all that good stuff. So we are coming towards the end of our book. If anyone has requests the next audiobook, please let me know in the comment section. Um, also, I've started doing some live classes. I'll be posting those twice a week on YouTube. And if you want to attend one of those live classes, please take a check out our webpage at flyingtortoise.org on the scheduling section. All right, everyone, have a great day. Let's have some fun. The usual gang was present. Teddy, Beckett, Mitch, and Annie. But this time, there was also Mindy Park, as well as a man Mitch had never seen before. What's up, Frank? Mitch asked. Why are the sudden meeting? We've got some developments, Beckett said. Mindy, why don't you bring them up to date? Ah, uh, yeah, Mindy said. Looks like Watney finished the balloon addition to the trailer. It mostly uses the design we sent him. Any idea how stable it is? Teddy asked. Pretty stable, she said. It's been inflated for several days with no problems. Also, he built some kind of room. Room? Teddy asked. It's made of hab canvas, I think. Mindy explained. It attaches to the rover's airlock. I think he cut a section out of the hat to make it. I don't know what it's for. Teddy turned to Beckett. Why would he do that? We think it's a workshop, Beckett said. There'll be a lot of work to do on the MAV once he gets to Schiaparelli. It'll be easier without an EVA suit. He probably plans to do as much as he can in that room. Clever, Teddy said. Juan needs a clever guy, Mitch said. How about getting life support in there? I think he's done it, Mindy said. He moved the AREC. Sorry, Annie interrupted. What's an AREC? It's the external component of the atmospheric regulator, Mindy said. It sits outside the half, so I saw when it disappeared. He probably mounted it on the rover. There's no other reason to move it, so I'm guessing he's got life support online. Awesome, Rich said. Things are coming together. Don't celebrate yet, Mitch, Beckett said. He gestured to the newcomer. This is Randall Carter, one of our Martian meteorologists. Randall, tell them what you told me. Randall nodded. Thank you, Dr. Kapoor. He turned his laptop around to show a map of Mars. Over the past few weeks, a dust storm has been developing in Arabia Terra. Not a big deal in terms of magnitude. It won't hinder his driving at all. So what's the problem? Annie asked. It's a low-velocity dust storm, Randall explained. Slow winds, but fast enough to pick up very small particles on the surface and whip them into thick clouds. There are five or six of them every year. The thing is, they last for months, they cover huge sections of the planet, and they make the atmosphere thick with dust. I still don't see the problem, Annie said. Light, Randall said. The total sunlight reaching the surface is very low in the area of the storm. Right now, it's 20% of normal, and Watney's rover is powered by solar panels. Shit, Mitch said, rubbing his eyes. And we can't warn him. So he gets less power, Andy said. Can't he just recharge longer? The current plan already has him recharging all day long, Bennett explained. With 20% of normal daylight, take five times as long to get the same energy. It'll turn his 45 soul trip into 225 souls. He'll miss the Hermes flyby. Can't Hermes wait for him? Annie asked. It's a flyby, Beckett said. Hermes isn't going into Martian orbit. If they did, they wouldn't be able to get back. They need their velocity for the return trajectory. After a few moments of silence, Teddy said, just have to hope he finds a way through. We can track his progress and... No, we can't, Mindy interrupted. We can't, Teddy said. She shook her head. The satellites won't be able to see through the dust. Once he enters the affected area, we won't see anything until he comes out the other side. Well, Teddy said. Shit. Log entry. Sol 439. Before I risk my life, I need to test it. And not the little tests I've been doing so far. Sure, I've tested power generation, life support, the trailer bubble, and the bedroom. But I need to test all aspects.
aspects of it working together. I'm going to load it up for the long trip and drive in circles. I won't ever be more than 500 meters from the half, so I'll be fine if shit breaks. I dedicated today to loading up the rover and trailer for the test. I want the weight to match what it'll be on the real trip. Plus, if cargo is going to shift around or break things, I want to know about it now. I made one concession to common sense. I left most of my water supply in the half. I loaded 20 liters, enough for the test, but no more. There are a lot of ways I could lose pressure in this mechanical abomination I've created, and I don't want all my water to boil off if that happens. On the real trip, I'm going to have 620 liters of water. I made up the weight difference by loading 600 kilograms of rocks in with my other supplies. Back on Earth, universities and governments are willing to pay millions to get their hands on Mars rocks. I'm using them as ballast. I'm doing one more little test tonight. I made sure the batteries were good and full, then disconnected the rover and trailer from half power. I'll be sleeping in the half, but I left the rover's life support on. It'll maintain the air overnight, and tomorrow I'll see how much power it ate up. I've watched the power consumption while it's attached to the half, and there weren't any surprises. But this will be the true proof. I call it the plugs out test. That's not the best name. gathered in the wreck. Let's get through status quickly, Lewis said. We're all behind in our science assignments. Vogel, you first. I repaired the bad cable on Vassima 4, Vogel reported. It was our last thick gauge cable. If another such problem occurs, we will have to braid lower gauge lines to carry the current. Also, the power output from the reactor is declining. Johansson, Lewis said. What's the deal with the reactor? I have to dial it back, Johansson said. It's the cooling vanes. They aren't radiating heat as well as they used to. They're tarnishing. How can that happen? Lewis asked. They're outside the craft. There's nothing for them to react with. I think they picked up dust or small air leaks from Hermes itself. One way or another, they're definitely tarnishing. The tarnish is clogging the micro lattice, and that reduces the surface area. Less surface area means less heat dissipation. So I limited the reactor enough that we weren't getting positive heat. Any chance of repairing the cooling vanes? It's on the microscopic scale, Johansson said. We'd need a lab. Usually they replace the vanes after each mission. Will we be able to maintain engine power for the rest of the mission? Yes, if the rate of tarnishing doesn't increase. All right, keep an eye on it. Beck has life support. Limping, Beck said. We've been in space way longer than it was designed to handle. There are a bunch of filters that would normally be replaced each mission. I found a way to clean them with a chemical bath I made in the lab, but it eats away at the filters themselves. We're okay right now, but who knows what will break next. We knew this would happen, Lewis said. The design of Hermes assumed it would get an overhaul after each mission, but we've extended Ares 3 from 396 days to 898. Things are going to break. We've got all of NASA to help when that happens. We just need to stay on top of maintenance. Martinez, what's the deal with your bunk room? Martinez furrowed his brow. He's still trying to cook me. The climate control just isn't keeping up. I think it's the tubing in the walls that brings the coolant. I can't get at it because it's built into the hull. We can use the room for storage of non-temperature sensitive cargo, but that's about it. So did you move into Mark's room? It's right next to mine, he said. It has the same problem. Where have you been sleeping? In airlock too? It's the only place I can be without people tripping over me. No good, Lewis said, shaking her head. If one seal breaks, you die. I can't think of anywhere else to sleep, he said. The ship is pretty grand, and if I sleep in a hallway, I'll be in people's way. Okay, from now on, sleep in Beck's room. Beck can sleep with Johansson. Johansson blushed and looked down awkwardly. So, Beck said know about that? You thought I didn't? Lewis said. It's a small ship. You're not mad? If it were a normal mission, I would be, Lewis said. But we're way off script now. Just keep it from interfering with your duties, and I'm happy. Million Mile High Club, Martinez said. Nice. Johansson blushed deeper and buried her face in her hands. Log entry. Soul 444. I'm getting pretty good at this. Maybe when all this is over, I could be a product tester for Mars rovers. Things went well. I spent five
five souls driving in circles. I averaged 93 kilometers per soul. That's a little better than I'd expected. The terrain here is flat and smooth, so it's pretty much a best case scenario. Once I'm going up hills and around boulders, it won't be nearly that good. The bedroom is awesome. Large, spacious, and comfortable. On the first night, I ran into a little problem with the temperature. It was fucking cold. The rover and trailer regulate their own temperatures just fine, but things weren't hot enough in the bedroom. Story of my life. The rover has an electric heater that pushes air with a small fan. I don't use the heater itself or anything because the RTG provides all the heat I need, so I liberated the fan and wired it into a power line near the airlock. Once it had power, all I had to do was point it at the bedroom. It's a low-tech solution, but it worked. There's plenty of heat thanks to the RTG. I just needed to get it evenly spread out. For once, entropy was on my side. I've discovered that raw potatoes are disgusting. When I'm in the hab, I cook my taters using a small microwave. I don't have anything like that in the rover. I could easily bring the hab's microwave into the rover and wire it in, but the energy required to cook 10 potatoes a day would actually cut into my driving distance. I fell into a routine pretty quickly. In fact, it was hard to rotation. Here. I did it for 22 miserable souls on the Pathfinder trip. But this time, I have the bedroom, and that makes all the difference. Instead of being cooped up in the rover, I have my own little app. After waking up, I have a potato for breakfast. Then I deflate the bedroom from the inside. It's kind of tricky, but I worked out how. First, I put on an EVA suit. Then I close the inner airlock door, leaving the outer door, which the bedroom is attached to, open. This isolates the bedroom with me in it from the rest of the rover. Then I tell the airlock to depressurize. It thinks it's just pumping the air out of a small area, but it's actually deflating the whole bedroom. Once the pressure is gone, I pull the canvas in and fold it. Then I detach it from the outer hatch and close the outer door. This is the most cramped part. I have to share the airlock with the entire folded up bedroom while it repressurizes. Once I have pressure again, I open the inner door and more or less fall into the rover. Then I stow the bedroom and go back to the airlock for a normal egress to Mars. It's Left a leg, extra rotation. But it detaches the bedroom without having to depressurize the rover cabin. Remember, the rover has all my stuff that doesn't play well with vacuum. The next step is to gather up the solar cells I laid out the day before and stow them on the rover and trailer. Then I do a quick check on the trailer. I go in through its airlock and basically take a quick look at all the equipment. I don't even take off my EVA suit. I just want to make sure nothing's obviously wrong. Then, back to the rover. Once inside, I take off the EVA suit and start driving. I drive for almost four hours, and then I'm out of power. Once I park, it's back into the EVA suit for me and out to Mars again. I lay the solar panels out and get the batteries charging. Then I set up the bedroom, pretty much the reverse of the sequence I used to stow it. Ultimately, it's the airlock that inflates it. In a way, the bedroom is just an extension of the airlock. Agreed. Even though it's possible, I don't rapid inflate the bedroom. I did that to test it because I wanted to find where it'll leak, but it's not a good idea. Rapid inflation puts a lot of shock and pressure on it. It would eventually rupture. I didn't enjoy that time the hab launched me like a cannonball. I'm not eager to repeat it. Once the bedroom is set up again, I can take off my EVA suit and relax. I mostly watch crappy 70s TV. I'm indistinguishable from an unemployed guy for most of the day. I followed that process for four souls, and then it was time for an air day. An air day turns out to be pretty much the same as any other day, but without the four-hour drive. Once I set up the solar panels, I fired up the oxygenator and let it work through the backlog of CO2 that the regulator had stored up. It converted all the CO2 to oxygen and used up the day's power generation to do it. The test was a success. I'll be ready on time. Internal rotation, right leg. So 449. Today's the big day. I'm leaving for Schiaparelli. Rover and trailer are all packed. They've been mostly packed since the test run, but now I even have the water aboard. Over the last few days, I cooked all the potatoes with the Habs microwave. It took quite a while because the microwave gets
can only hold four at a time. After cooking, I put them back out on the surface to freeze. Once frozen, I put them back in the rover's saddlebags. This may seem like a waste of time, but it's critical. Instead of eating raw potatoes during my trip, I'll be eating cold, pre-cooked potatoes. First off, they'll taste a lot better, but more important, they'll be cooked. When you cook food, the proteins break down and the food becomes easier to digest. I'll get more calories out of it, and I need every calorie I can get my hands on. I Left spent the last several days running full diagnostics on everything. A regulator, oxygenator, RTG, AREC, batteries, rover life support, in case I need a backup. Solar cells, rover computer, airlocks, and everything else with a moving part or electronic component. I even checked each of the motors. Eight in all, one for each wheel, four on the rover, four on the trailer. The trailer's motors won't be powered, but it's nice to have backups. It's all good to go. No problems that I can see. The hat is a shell of its former self. I've robbed it of all critical components and a big chunk of its canvas. I've looted that poor hat for everything it could give me, and in return, it's kept me alive for a year and a half. It's like the giving tree. I performed the final shutdown today. The heaters, lighting, main computer, etc. Figure eights. All the components I didn't steal for the trip to Schiaparelli. I could have left them on. It's not like anyone would care. But the original procedure for Sol 31, which was supposed to be the last day of the surface mission, was to completely shut down the hab and deflate it, because NASA didn't want a big tent full of combustible oxygen next to the MAV when it launched. I guess I did the shutdown as an homage to the mission Ares 3 could have been. A small piece of the Sol 31 I never got to have. Once I'd shut everything down, the interior of the hab was eerily silent. I spent 449 souls listening to its heaters, vents, and fans. But now it was dead quiet. It was a creepy kind of quiet that's hard to describe. I've been away from the noises of the hat before, but always in a rover or an EVA suit, both of which have noisy machinery of their own. But now there was nothing. I never realized how utterly silent Mars is. It's a desert world. Practically no atmosphere to convey sound. I could okay. hear my own heartbeat. Chung shoulder opening. Anyway, enough waxing philosophical. I'm in the rover right now. That should be obvious with the half main computer offline forever. I've got two full batteries, all systems are go, and I've got 45 souls of driving ahead of me. Ski apparelli or bust. Chapter 22. Log entry, Sol 458. Marth Vallis, finally here. Actually, it's not an impressive accomplishment. I've only been traveling 10 souls, but it's a good psychological milestone. So far, the rover and my ghetto life support are working admirably, at least as well as can be expected for equipment being used 10 times longer than intended. Today is my second air day. First was five souls ago. When I put this scheme together, I figured air days would be god awful boring. But now I look forward to them, and my day's off. On a normal day, I get up, fold up the bedroom, stack the solar cells, drive four hours, set up the solar cells, unfurl the bedroom, check all my equipment, especially the rover chassis and wheels, then make a Morse code status report for NASA if I can find enough nearby rocks. On an air day, I wake up and turn on the oxygenator. The solar panels are already out from the day before. Everything's ready to go. Then I chill out in the bedroom or rover. I have the whole day to myself. The bedroom gives me enough space that I don't feel cooped up, and the computer has plenty of shitty TV reruns for me to enjoy. Technically, I entered Mark Vallis yesterday, but I only knew that by looking at a map. The entrance to the valley is okay. wide enough that I couldn't see Other the side. walls in either direction. But now I'm definitely in a canyon. And the bottom is nice and flat. Exactly what I was hoping for. It's amazing. This valley wasn't made by a river slowly carving it away. It was made by a mega flood in a single day. Would have been a hell of a thing to see. Weird thought. I'm not an Acidalia Planitia anymore. 
I spent 457 souls there, almost a year and a half, and I'll never go back. I wonder if I'll be nostalgic about that later in life. If there is a later in life, I'll be happy to endure a little nostalgia. But for now, I just want to go home. Welcome back to CNN's Mark Watney Report, Kathy said to the camera. We're speaking with our frequent guest, Dr. Venkat Kapoor. Dr. Kapoor, I guess what people want to know is, is Mark Watney doomed? We hope not, Venkat responded. But he's got a real challenge ahead of him. According to your latest satellite data, the dust storm in Arabia Terra isn't abating at all and will block 80% of the sunlight. That's correct. And Watney's only source of energy is his solar panels, correct? Yes, that's right. Can his makeshift rover operate at 20% power? We haven't found any way to make that happen, no. His life support alone takes more energy than that. How long until he enters the storm? He's just entered Morph Valis now. At his current rate of travel, he'll be at the edge of the storm on Sol 471. That's 12 days from now. Surely he'll see something is wrong, Kathy said. With such low visibility, it won't take long for him to realize his solar cells will have a problem. Couldn't he just turn around at that point? Unfortunately, everything's working against him, Venkat said. The edge of the storm isn't a magic line. It's just an area where the dust gets a little more dense. It'll keep getting more and more dense as he travels onward. All right, line seven. Every day will be slightly 64. darker than the last. Too subtle to notice. Bank inside. He'll go hundreds of kilometers wondering why his solar panel efficiency is going down before he notices any visibility problems. And the storm is moving west as he moves east. He'll be too deep in to get out. Are we just watching a so, tragedy play out? Once Can again. Ask? There's always hope, Bank said. Maybe he'll figure it out faster than we think and turn around in time. Maybe the storm will dissipate unexpectedly. Maybe he'll find a way to keep his life support going on less energy than we thought was possible. Mark Watney so, is now an expert at surviving on Mars. First move. If anyone can do it, it's him. Twelve days, Kathy said to the camera. All of Earth is watching, but powerless to help. Log entry. Soul 462. Another uneventful soul. Tomorrow is an air day, so this is kind of my Friday night. I'm about halfway through Mark Ballast now. Just as I hoped, the going has been easy. No major elevation changes, hardly any obstacles. Just smooth sand with rocks smaller than half a meter. You may be wondering how I navigate. When I went to Pathfinder, I watched Phobos cranching the sky to figure out the east-west axis. But Pathfinder was an easy trip compared to this, and I had plenty of landmarks to navigate by. I can't get away with that this time. My map, such as it is, consists of satellite images far too low resolution to be of any use. I can only see major landmarks, like craters 50 kilometers across. They just never expected me to be out this far. The only reason I had high-res images of the Pathfinder region is because they were included for landing purposes, in case Martinez had to land way long of our target. So this time around, I needed a reliable way to fix my position on Mars. Latitude and longitude. That's the key. The first is easy. Ancient sailors on Earth figured that one out right away. Earth's 23.5 degree axis points at Polaris. Mars has a tilt of just over 25 degrees, so it's pointed at Deneb. Making a sextant isn't hard. All you need is a tube to look through, a string, a weight, and something with degree markings. I made mine in under an hour. So I go out every night with a homemade sextant inside Deneb. It's kind of silly if you think about it. I'm in my spacesuit on Mars and I'm navigating with 16th century tools, but hey, they work. Longitude is a different matter. On Earth, the earliest way to work out longitude required them to know the exact time, then compare it to the sun's position in the sky. The hard part for them back then was inventing a clock that would work on a boat. Pendulums don't work on boats. All the top scientific minds of the age worked on the problem. Fortunately, I have accurate clocks. There are four computers in my immediate line of sight right now, and I have Phobos. Because Phobos is ridiculously close to Mars, it orbits the planet in less than 
one Martian day. It travels west to east, unlike the sun and Deimos, and sets every 11 hours. And naturally, it moves in a very predictable pattern. I spend 13 hours every soul just sitting around while the solar panels charge the batteries. Phobos is guaranteed to set at least once during that time. I note the time when it does, then I plug it into a nasty formula I worked out, and I know my longitude. So working out longitude requires Phobos to set, and working out latitude requires it to be night so I can sight dead at. It's not a very fast system, but I only need it once a day. I work out my location when I'm parked, and account for it in the next day's travel. It's kind of a successive approximation thing. So far I think it's been working, but who knows? I can see it now. Me holding a map, scratching my head, trying to figure out how I ended up on Venus. Mindy Park zoomed in on the latest satellite photo and practiced ease. Pompey's encampment was visible in the center. The solar cells laid out in a circular pattern as was his habit. The workshop was inflated. Checking the timestamp on the image, she saw it was from noon local time. She quickly found the status report. Wapney always placed it close to the rover when rocks were in abundance, usually to the north. To save time, Mindy had taught herself Morse code, so she wouldn't have to look each letter up every morning. She opened an email and addressed it to the ever-growing list of people who wanted Wapney's daily status message. On track for Seoul 494 arrival. She frowned and added, Note, five souls until dust storm entry. Log entry. Soul 466. Mark Vallis was fun while it lasted. I'm in Arabia Terra now. I just entered the edge of it, and my latitude and longitude calculations are correct. But even without the math, it's pretty obvious the terrain is changing. For the last two souls, I've spent almost all my time on an incline working my way up the back wall of Mark Vallis. It was a gentle rise, but a constant one. I'm at a much higher altitude now. Acidalia Planitia, where the lonely hab is hanging out, is 3,000 meters below elevation zero, and Arabia Terra is 500 meters below. So I've gone up two and a half kilometers. Want to know what elevation zero means? On Earth, it's sea level. Obviously, that won't work on Mars. So lab-coated geeks got together and decided Mars' elevation zero is where the air pressure is 610.5 pascals. That's about 500 meters up from where I am right now. Now things get tricky. Back in Acidalia Planitia, if I got off course, I could just point in the right direction based on new data. Later, in Mark Vallis, it was impossible to screw up. I just had to follow the canyon. Now I'm in a rougher neighborhood, the kind of neighborhood where you keep your rover doors locked and never come to a complete stop at intersections. Well, not really, but it's bad to get off course here. Arabia Terra has large, brutal craters that I have to drive around. If I navigate poorly, I'll end up at the edge of one. I can't just drive down one side and up the other. Rising in elevation costs a ton of energy. On flat ground, I can make 90 kilometers per day. On a steep slope, I'd be lucky to get 40 kilometers. Plus, driving on a slope is dangerous. One mistake and I can roll the rover. I don't even want to think about that. Yes, I'll eventually have to drive down into Schiaparelli. No way around that. I'll have to be really careful. Anyway, if I end up at the edge of a crater, I'll have to backtrack to somewhere useful. And it's a damn maze of craters out here. I'll have to be on my guard observant at all times. I'll need to navigate with landmarks as well as latitude and longitude. My first challenge is to pass between the craters Rutherford and Truvalo. It shouldn't be too hard. They're a hundred kilometers apart. Even I can't fuck that up, right? Right? Log entry. Sol 468. I managed to thread the needle between Rutherford and Truvalo nicely. Admittedly, the needle was 100 kilometers wide, but hey. I'm now enjoying my fourth air day of the trip. I've been on the road for 20 souls. So far, I'm right on schedule. According to my maps, I've traveled 1,440 kilometers. Not quite halfway there, but almost. I've been gathering soil and rock samples from each place I can. I did the same thing on my way to Pathfinder. But this time, 
I know NASA's watching me. I'm labeling each sample by the current soul. They'll know my location a hell of a lot more accurately than I do. They can correlate the samples with their locations later. It might be a wasted effort. The MAV isn't going to have much weight allowance when I launch. To intercept Hermes, it'll have to reach escape velocity, but it was only designed to get to orbit. The only way to get it going fast enough is to lose a lot of weight. At least that jury rigging will be NASA's job to work out, not mine. Once I get to the MAP, I'll be back in contact with them, and they can tell me what modifications to make. They'll probably say thanks for gathering samples, but leave them behind. And one of your arms, too. Whichever one you like least. But on the off chance I can bring the samples, I'm gathering them. The next few days' travel should be easy. The next major obstacle is Marth Crater. It's right in my straight line path towards Schiaparelli. It'll cost me a hundred kilometers or so to go around. But it can't be helped. I'll try to aim for the southern edge. The closer I get to the rim, the less time I'll waste going around it. Did you read today's updates? Sat pulling her meal from the microwave. Yeah, Martinez said, sipping his drink. She sat across the red table from him and carefully opened the steaming package. She decided to put a little bit before eating. Mark entered the dust storm yesterday. Yeah, I saw that. We need to face the possibility that he won't make it to Schiaparelli, Lewis said. If that happens, we need to keep morale up. We still have a long way to go before we get home. He was dead before, Martinez said. It was rough on morale, but we soldiered on. Besides, he won't die. It's pretty bleak, Lewis said. He's already 50 kilometers into the storm, and he'll go another 90 kilometers per soul. He'll get him too deep to recover soon. Martinez shook his head. He'll pull through the man. Have faith. She smiled for a moment. Rick, you know I'm not religious. I know, he said. I'm not talking about faith in God. I'm talking about faith in Mark Watney. Look at all the shit Mars has thrown at him, and he's still alive. He'll survive this. I don't know how, but he will. He's a clever son of a bitch. Lewis took a bite of her food. I hope you're right. What about a hundred bucks? Martinez said with a smile. Of course not, Lewis said. Damn right, he smiled. I'd never bet on a crewmate dying, Lewis said. But that doesn't mean I think you'll blah, 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 Martinez interrupted. Deep down, you think you'll make it. Log entry. Soul 473. My fifth air day, and things are going well. I should be skimming south of Mark Crater tomorrow. It'll get easier after that. I'm in the middle of a bunch of craters that form a triangle. I'm calling it the Wapi Triangle, because after what I've been through, stuff on Mars should be named after me. Trubalo, Becquerel, and Marth form the points of the triangle, with five other major craters along the sides. Normally, this wouldn't be a problem at all, but with my extremely rough navigation, I could easily end up at the lip of one of them and have to backtrack. After Marth, I'll be out at the Wapi Triangle. Yeah, I'm liking that name more and more. Then I can beeline towards Schiaparelli with impunity. There will still be plenty of craters in the way, but they're comparatively small, and going around them won't cost much time. Progress has been great. Arabia Terra is certainly rockier than Acidalia Planitia, but nowhere near as bad as I feared. I've been able to drive over most of the rocks and around the ones that are too big. I have 1,435 kilometers left to go. I did some research on Schiaparelli and found some good news. The best way in is right in my direct line path. I won't have to drive the perimeter at all. The way in is easy to find even when you suck at navigating. The northwest rim has a small crater on it. But that's the landmark I'll be looking for. To the southwest of that little crater is a gentle slope into Schiaparelli Basin. The little crater doesn't have a name, at least not on the maps I have, so I dub it Entrance Crater, because I can. In other news, my equipment is starting to show signs of age. Not surprising, considering it's way the hell past its expiration date. For the past two souls, the batteries have taken longer to recharge. The solar cells just aren't producing as much wattage as before. It's not a big deal. I just need to charge a little longer. Log entry. Soul 474. Well, I fucked it up. It was bound to happen eventually. I navigated badly and ended up at the ridge of Mark Crater. Because it's 100 kilometers wide, I can't see the whole thing, so I don't know where on the circle I am. The ridge runs perpendicular to the direction I was going, so I have no clue which way I should go, and I don't want to take the long way around if I can avoid it. Originally, I wanted
wanted to go around to the south, but north is just as likely to be the best path now that I'm off course. I'll have to wait for another Phobos transit to get my longitude, and I'll need to wait for nightfall to sight Deneb for my latitude. So I'm done driving for the day. Luckily, I made 70 kilometers out of the 90 kilometers I usually do, so it's not too much wasted progress. Marth isn't too steep. I could probably just drive down one side and up the other. It's big enough that I'd end up camping inside it one night, but I don't want to take unnecessary risks. The slopes are bad and should be avoided. I gave myself plenty of buffer time, so I'm going to play it safe. I'm ending today's drive early and setting up for recharge. Probably a good idea anyway with the solar cells acting up. It will give them more time to work. They underperformed again last night. I checked all the connections and made sure there wasn't any dust on them, but they still just aren't 100%. Log entry. Sol 475. I'm in trouble. I watched two Phobos transits yesterday and sighted Deneb last night. I worked out my location as accurately as I could, and it wasn't what I wanted to see. As far as I can tell, I hit Marth Crater dead on. Crap. I can go north or south. One of them will probably be better than the other because it'll be a shorter path around the crater. I figured I should put at least a little effort into figuring out which direction was best, so I took a little walk this morning. It was over a kilometer to the peak of the rim. That's the sort of walk people do on Earth without thinking twice, but in an EVA suit, it's an ordeal. I can't wait till I have grandchildren. When I was younger, I had to walk to the rim of a crater, uphill, in an EVA suit, on Mars, you little shit. You hear me? Mars! Anyway, I got up to the rim, and damn, it's a beautiful sight. From my high vantage points, I got a stunning panorama. I figured I might be able to see the far side of Mars Crater and maybe work out the best way around, but I couldn't see the far side. There's a haze in the air. It's not uncommon. Mars has weather and wind and dust, after all. But it seemed hazier than it should. I'm accustomed to the wide-open expanses of Acidalia Planitia, my former prairie home. Then it got weirder. I turned around and looked back toward the rover and trailer. Everything was where I'd left it. Very few car leaves on Mars. But the view seemed a lot clearer. I looked east, across Marth again then west to the horizon, then east, then west. Each turn required me to rotate my whole body, EVA suits being what they are. Yesterday I passed a crater. It's about 50 kilometers west of here. It's just visible on the horizon. But looking east, I can't see anywhere near that far. Marth Crater is 110 kilometers wide. With a visibility of 50 kilometers, I should at least be able to see a distinct curvature of the rim, but I can't. At first I didn't know what to make of it, but the lack of symmetry bothered me, and I've learned to be suspicious of everything. That's when a bunch of stuff started to dawn on me. One, the only explanation for asymmetrical visibility is a dust storm. Two, dust storms reduce the effectiveness of solar cells. Three, my solar cells have been slowly losing effectiveness for several souls. From this, I concluded the following. One, I've been in a dust storm for several souls. Two, shit. Not only am I in a dust storm, but it gets thicker as I approach Schiaparelli. A few hours ago, I was worried because I had to go around Marth Crater. Now I'm going to have to go around something a lot bigger. And I have to hustle. Dust storms move. Sitting still means I'll likely get overwhelmed. But which way do I go? It's no longer an issue of trying to be efficient. If I go the wrong way this time, I'll eat dust and die. I don't have satellite imagery. I have no way of knowing the size or shape of the storm or its heading. Man, I'd give anything for a five-minute conversation with NASA. Now that I think of it, NASA must be shitting bricks watching this play out. I'm on the clock. I have to figure out how to figure out what I need to know about the storm. And I have to do it now. And right this second, nothing comes to mind. Mindy trudged to her computer. Today's ship began.
began at 2.10 p.m. Her schedule matched Watney's every day. She slept when he slept. Watney. All right, everyone. Thank you for watching. That's what we have for today. I'll be posting more tomorrow, and again, Wednesday night, um, there'll be live classes at the studio. So if you want to head to flyingtortoise.com schedule and sign up for that, it'd be awesome to see you all there. Take care.